We are live. All right. Well, good evening, everyone who has joined us on the Centers of Wellness for Urban Women page, also affectionately known as CWU. Um, I am your uh, host. I love, just love being able to say that. I am your host for this evening um, for a very, very important um, conversation this evening, the importance of spiritual growth during these times of COVID-19, um, racism, and other issues. And um, my name is Michelle May. I am a board member for CWU. I'm the secretary. I am a licensed professional counselor, a professional development and career coach, and also a professional musician. I'm a violinist and pianist. Um, I wanted to take a minute to talk about CWU and the important mission that we have um, you know, in, our, in our community. CWU is based out of Indianapolis, and the vision statement is that every um, urban woman will create a culture of wellness. The mission of CWU is that we empower women and their families living in urban communities to take action in their health and well-being through education, ad advocacy, trying to say that word, advocacy, <laughs> prevention, and care. And much of the programming is around um, our conceptualization of seven dimensions of wellness. And our seven dimensions of wellness that we recognize are physical, spiritual, environmental, occupational, intellectual, emotional, and social. These dimensions of wellness stress a balance in lifestyle and support healthy living. Siru believes that addressing each dimension leads to healthy decision-making and a healthy family structure. We provide a supportive setting and support system to assist the participant in understanding the various ways she can approach successful healing and to have a better understanding of why preventative health is important. Our goals are to empower women living in urban settings as healthcare consumers and decision makers. We want to create healthier communities with more integrated and coordinated women's health delivery systems targeted to women and assist women in the navigation of health and wellness services, including mental health. We want to promote health and wellness and offer tools and resources through various marketing mechanisms, such as social marketing. Tonight is an example. We want to improve health outcomes for women and eliminate health disparities for women who are underserved due to age, gender, gender identity, race or ethnicity, education, income, sexual orientation, or any woman who may feel she can't successfully access quality health care. We want to spread the success of our women's health programs to communities across the country that may be interested in replicating the c model. And finally, we follow the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's social determinants of health, which are, and I quote, the social determinants of health are the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work, and age, as well as the systems put in place to deal with illness. To deal with illness. These circumstances are in turn shaped by a wider set of forces, economics, social policy, policies, and politics. CWU acknowledges the barriers which are in place to prevent women and their families from being proactive in their own health. Through advocacy and education, we hope to reduce these barriers and empower women to live healthier lives. And I'm very proud to represent CWU in this mission. Tonight, we're gonna to have a very important conversation. I have very three wonderful very, uh, women with me um, who will um, give their take on our topic tonight, which again, is the importance of spiritual growth, growth during these times of COVID-19 racism and other issues. Um, as you all are coming in, um, I will let you know that we are going to be taking questions later and um, you can type them down in the chat um, and I will be kind of monitoring that as we're talking um, to see what questions we have. And at the end, of course, we will be able to do that. So before we begin, of course, we want to know who these wonderful women are. So I would like to take a moment um, for each of them to introduce themselves and um, give you an idea about their background and um, their work in this area. So I'm going to begin uh, with Dr. Angela Celeste May from Detroit, Michigan. Hello, um, I am Dr. Angela Celeste May. I am Michelle's sister, younger sister. <laughs> And um, uh, as Michelle mentioned, uh, which, uh, I am also a professional musician. We come from a family of professional musicians. So I'm a musician and a psychologist, a clinical organizational and forensic. 
Um, I'm an educator, I'm former dissertation chair uh, for the School for Advanced Studies at University of Phoenix. And currently I teach at the uh, Wayne County Community College District in their psychology department. Um, I'm also an author and public speaker. Uh, I play multiple instruments and, and like I said, I, am, I teach in the music area as well. So I, I'm uh, very pleased to be here today and honored. I bring the, the, um, the psychology background to this today, but also the creativity that we all carry with us. Um, and I also say this too, um, we come from a family uh, very much, of course, deeply rooted in our Christian faith. Um, but we have uh, many ministers and, and evangelists in our family. So that was a part of the environment that we grew up in. And um, the matriarch, our, matriarch of our family was very much a spiritual leader in the community as well. So all of that influences what brings me here uh, and us here today. Absolutely. Thank you, sister. <laughs> okay. Next, um, we have Sh uh, Pastor Cheryl Crawford Gore, who's also from Detroit. And we honored women uh, in Siwu. Um, who we thought represented our various, our seven dimensions of wellness. And um, Pastor Cheryl was one of the nominees for spiritual wellness. So I wanted to make sure that we um, had you here today to speak with us. So please let us Thank know you. about your view. Well, yes, I am Cheryl Crawford Gore and uh, I'm mother of four. I have seven grandchildren and uh, I work with uh, SOS Community Services in Ypsilanti as a parent educator and advocate. Um, we service families who are uh, coming out of homelessness, entering into homelessness, um, moms and dads, males and females who've been um, victims of domestic violence. We um, help support with mental health issues. We connect with various resources uh, in Western Wayne and Washington counties uh, to help promote the well-being of uh, all of our families who are uh, predominantly African-American families. So. Um, I find it very, uh, very gratifying work. I'm also an ordained minister, uh, as well come from a family where we have uh, ministers and pastors and evangelists. And I'm also a professional musician. So I've been playing in churches throughout Detroit since I was eight years old. So that's, that's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just enjoy um, partnering with people and connecting with people to help build people up, to edify and encourage people along a life's journey. So I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you so much, Pastor Cheryl. We're excited to have you here also. Okay, and so as I mentioned earlier, um, just a few minutes ago, that we do um, honor women who represent um, our seven dimensions of wellness. And so our honoree for 2020 was this next wonderful young lady. Um, we are very happy to have you here with us also, Idalia Wilmot. Please introduce yourself. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. My name is Idalia Wilma. I am a woman of many hats, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. I am a fashion curator, but I'm also an educator. I work in Africana studies and black consciousness. Um, I'm right now finishing up my PhD in urban education. I received my master's in urban education looking at post-secondary issues. I'm all about racism so i'm the one who stirs the pot and will let the pot stir and let it stir and let it stir um as far as my spirituality i grew up in the church i have never departed from there so growing up as far as as i'm i guess i'm the old millennial pool um, <laughs> um I have never left the church. Um, growing up, I grew up in the most spiritual family and I love them so much where they taught me um, who you need to turn your help to. And so, um, so those things, those different things that growing up. So I say that I'm an innovator, I'm a creative, I'm an artist, you know, I sing on the praise team, you know, I used to play instruments, I am now rusty, so don't catch me coming playing no violin. Because <laughs> um, it's right here in the closet, okay, just dusty. But I love music. Um, I love fashion and I love the Lord and I intertwine all of those different narratives and weave those inter narratives of cultural identity, but also weaving cultural identity into spirituality as well. And so um, it's great to be here. So I'm truly excited. 
Oh, I'm so happy to have you. I want to say that um, the four of us, although we will be talking about spirituality and, you know, um, you know, from whatever background you may be coming from, our uh, lens is through the lens of Christianity, but we will be talking about um, spirituality as a whole and leaning into your faith from whatever background that you come from. So with that, I want to get started. And again, I'd like to say, um, if you're coming in and you have questions, we will be taking questions at the end. You can um, put them in the chat and I will attempt to you know, scroll through and check them out. But um, I wanted to start off with the, um, you know, opening up uh, our discussion with, um, for each of you, if you could um, let our audience know how you define spiritual wellness. And you can go whichever, well, actually, why don't we start with Dahlia first? We'll go backwards in my square here. So how do well, you define spiritual wellness? I define spiritual wellness as number one is that our spirit is connected to our soul. I believe that God created us in such a way that our it's a soul tie. And so within our souls comes is the spirit. And so while we have the outside spirit of God who created us and, and poured into us, he also poured in his breath. So that particular spirit lives with inside of us. And so uh, my sp spirituality is the spirit is within us. It, it, it's, it's something, um, especially within the Black community, um, we have this thing called a third space, okay? While we are just in this physical body, we also operate out of a spiritual soul tie. And so just coming from, I had to put a little Africana lens on there. Um, <laughs> right in. Uh, to, uh, to consider that. So that's why, that's why I believe. It is. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Pastor Cheryl, what are your thoughts, please, on spiritual wellness? How do you define it? Um, well, spiritual wellness to me is, um, you know, being confident that you have a healthy connection with your spiritual source, um, be it God or whatever your faith embracings are. Um, and that in times of crisis or calamity, um, you know within yourself where to turn. You know how to, to support to support those vulnerable places in your life, um, those situations that come at you. You have the equipping from within, you know, to pull from yourself um, that spiritual resource, that spiritual knowing, you know, that you need in order to prevail, in order to um, survive situations, uh, to come out on top, to be victorious. Um, and, and to me, you know, spiritual wellness is just tapping into that spiritual part of yourself that connects you to your spiritual source. You know, in many uh, respects, that's God to many of us. But uh, whatever your faith embracings are, you need to under you need to know how to tap in to that spiritual source so that you can be spiritually whole. Mm -hmm. So important, so important, Dr. May. Um, I would echo what both of my sisters have said. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, the family we, that we come from, um, spiritual wellness it's it's a muscle like any other muscle. The way the way we were raised and taught, um, it's something that you don't wait until if you can help it you know the tragedy the chaos the 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 challenge that it's a daily practice it's a practice like our arts it's a practice like you know you exercise so that when those hard times come that's when the the development of the strength of that um that connectedness um is really gets tested in the fire and then strengthened each time so uh i, I was telling the ladies before we started a little bit of my background in training um, I always say we do what we are. So I went into psychology um, largely because I brought my background with me and I was blessed to be uh, mentored by p black psychologists. Um, I was one of the founders and past president of the Metro Detroit chapter of the Association of Black Psychologists. And there's a very much an Afrocentric approach, which means if you're gonna be a whole healthy person um, unlike some of the more Western, shall we say, teachings of psychology, an Afrocentric perspective says you cannot be a whole person if you don't also address uh, what is uh, perhaps off-center or spiritual illness or, you know, that that is not whole as well. So I believe that um, spiritual wellness and wholeness is, um, it's increasing the, the connectedness and uh, practicing that every day to develop that muscle 
and to allow those testing times like we're in now to, uh, to call upon that muscle, that muscle memory to strengthen us even more so that we can continue not just to be whole, but to become even stronger. Yes, absolutely. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and we have some people that joined in the chat. Actually, um, my colleague Mia Reed from Detroit is here. And Mia actually was uh, Siwoo's intellectual honoree, intellectual wellness honoree. She says that spirituality is a complete package that motivates us to become whole, very much so. And also um, our executive director and founder of Siwoo, Rhonda Bayless, is also on in the chat too. So thank you for joining us here. So um, let's also, now that we've got kind of an overall definition, I want to get into the specifics of, um, you know, the two aspects that we're talking about when we say these times. So we're dealing with the COVID-19 as well as the racial injustice that we're dealing with. So um, my next question I want to uh, have addressed is how has the impact, first of all, of COVID-19 affected um, your work on a spiritual level, okay? Um, your work on the spiritual level. So whoever wants to jump in can jump in. Uh, um, I'll, I'll just add this real quickly. Um, one of the things I've said that I, I have said to others, but to myself also um, during this, the COVID-19 period of time that we're in is it's the same God. Like my mom always says, God knew about this yesterday. It feels, it, it feels scary. It feels like something new, but there's nothing new under the sun. And it's the same God that was taking care of us the day before we knew COVID-19 as it's taking care of us today. So I know one of the things that helps to me to feel stabilized and has been helpful to others <clears throat> is to remind them that that same faith, that same God that happened the night before we heard about COVID, he is what he or she is what's steady and hasn't moved. Um, so that, that is an anchoring factor. Uh, for myself and for other people I've shared that with. Yeah, for me, I've learned to just cry out. Oftentimes, um, especially, you know, black and brown communities, we tend to bottle up our emotions. And as we are understanding that we are going through spiritual warfare, which we have always been going through spiritual warfare, and it has always been here, it has never left. It's just the intensity of that spiritual warfare because now we're dealing with principalities and things of those things that we cannot see <laughs> that are in the rim. And so I can say uh, probably the first week, it was kind of like, ah, oh, you know, okay, I got this. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna wear my mask, I'm gonna wash my hands. <laughs> you know, right. I'm, I'm talking to my girlfriends, my sister friends, my my colleagues and things that are like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. But then as the second week started to roll, I could not go to sleep at night because God kept talking to me to say, number one, there needs to be a time of intercession. And so during this time, I just learned to just cry out because oftentimes we don't cry out. We think that crying out is some form of weakness or when we only cry out when we only need help. Sometimes you just need to cry out because God collects our tears to know that there are people who are being affected by COVID every time we blink. <laughs> every time we blink, they're affected in a ways in which that are totally different than what we think. We think it's more of a physical touch, but it's more than just that. Mental, spiritual, emotional, I mean, tugging wars and things of that nature. And I found myself being in this tug of war because I have a humanitarian spirit that I was looking across the screen on, on Facebook and TV and things that all that just crying my eyes out. Like how in the world, while I already know that we have the same God, there are issues that are gonna continue to press harder into the fire and press and press and press. And to the point where I could not go to sleep. I think I didn't go to sleep for like two nights in a row just because, and I couldn't even pray. I had to just sit there and just cry. So a part of the spirit is also recognizing that it's okay to, that God understands those cries. And those cries are not necessarily always pain, 
but those are birthing pains to birth something else. So don't let me get started because. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's all right. Yeah. Okay. That's very powerful. Very powerful. Pastor, Pastor Cheryl. Uh, yes, um, one of the things that has helped me, and I try to to echo, you know, the same sentiments to people that I work with, the many people that, you know, call you and seek you out for prayer and counseling, is that um, you have to remember. I, I always recall um, when God said, "I am that I am," you know, and when He was sending Moses, and Moses had all these different deficiencies and impediments and things, and he just just didn't feel like he was sufficient enough to go into Egypt and tell Pharaoh what he needed to tell Pharaoh what God was going to do. And he asked God, you know, who do I say sent me? And God said, you just tell him I am that I am has sent you. And to me, that really reflects the sovereignty of God. And I think about in every situation that we go through from the minutest, you know, little difficulty to something extraordinary like what we're facing right now that God is sovereign and he is in control and he said to us to be still and know that I am God and that causes you know me to center myself so that I can minister that those same sentiments to others because for a minute you know when you're on a you know when you're being tossed to and fro with different situations and then in this pandemic with all the racial unrest, um, the social unrest, the civil unrest that we're dealing with, you know, people need to know that there is an anchor, that there's stability somewhere that they can grab hold onto, you know, just like Jesus was in the ship sleeping when the storm <laughs> was tossing the disciples to and fro. Because <laughs> they needed to know that they had the sovereign that they had the sovereignty on board. They had the power on board. They had the one who was able to calm the raging seas. And so, you know, I think about the sovereignty of God, and that helps center me and calm down when I'm thinking about are my kids, you know, grandkids going to be okay? Is school going to start back? What are they going to have to deal with? Are they going to be safe? Are they going to be healthy? Are they going to be exposed? You think of all these different things, and I say, God, you are sovereign. And I'm just, I just need to be still and know that you are God. And that kind of helps me, you know, center myself and focus on, you know, just what that means. And it means a lot. It means a lot to those of us going through, you know, the myriad of emotions that this season is bringing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have a couple more comments here uh, from some of the people that have joined. Spiritual wellness and yes, building the muscle memory, vibrating our magnetic field. So one person said it's hard out here for those people that could see right now, you know, to, to see yours right now. Um, another person said, no, no fear, thankful that we can breathe our, move, breathe our movement, eat alive foods, chant, um, sound, share the seeds, and clear stagnant energy. Um, so, you know, very, very um, powerful, powerful. So shifting a little bit, same question, how, but this time with racism. How has the impact of the effects of racism, white supremacy, and inequities affected your work? Um, and we'll make the same circle around again. So Dr. Dr. Mamie can start. Um, well, one, one thing I was thinking about is, um, it, it goes hand in hand with both questions actually. And that is, um, I know I, I'm reminded and remind others that it, it looks chaotic to us and it is, but God knows what he's doing. And when I, when I have seen, as we've all seen George Floyd's, you know, death televised. And we know there's nothing, nothing new in our community at all. And when people say, we hear people say, uh, you know, what happened? What changed? What changed? People are finally fed up. No, we've been fed up. We've yeah. been talking about it right. for a good four or 500 years now. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that that's one of the things that's like, oh, well now, no, we, we, we have been sounding this alarm. But um, uh, the numbers of people outside of the black and brown community are seeing what we've been talking about. And I see for the racism, the COVID, but definitely the racism, I see God's hand all in that. 
that's an answer to prayer for, for me. And I don't mean his death. What I don't mean, of course not. But I see how God has used that death. I have never seen so many white people talking about how white people need to sit down and listen <laughs> and how white people need to learn and ask questions and recognize some of the assumptions they may, may uh, not to be, not to overgeneralize, obviously, but I've heard, heard so many people outside the black community talking for the first time outwardly about white privilege that they didn't know they even had. And, you know, um, I'm seeing God's work all in that. And that heartens me because it's a painful thing, but a necessary thing and a thing a long time in coming. So I see God's hand all in the use of this man's death uh, because George Floyd at this moment and, and Breonna Taylor and all, the, all those that we don't know their names of, at this moment, if they've made it to the other side, they're all right, you know, they're all right. But this world is being turned upside down by those deaths because it needed to be, it, it needed to be. Uh, and so I do see God's, uh, it heartens me uh, as I see God working through, you know, through this pain uh, to make some changes that have long, long since needed. And the last thing I'll say about that too also is um, I had the opportunity to speak to the pol chief of police here in Farmington, uh, in my area in Farmington Hills, suburb of Detroit. And um, it, it was a round table. This was a couple of years ago. So it was before this current time, but uh, lovely man, white gentleman. And he was talking about how he knows for a fact that he himself is not racist because he has black people, the Asian people in his family. <laughs> and of course I had to let him, exactly. As, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> exactly. No, don't apologize. Cause that's exactly what I said. No. Okay. Let's, let's hip you to the, no, that, that. Uh, but but to his credit, he was, he was listening. Like, well, tell me what did I miss? And I said exactly. Uh, and in that conversation, I brought up, uh, and I hear, we hear this today with officers, good officers who are really trying to understand, you know, what's going to. We've heard people say that the the police brutality does not come out of a vacuum. We know that these officers, those who perpetrate this, um, they come from a, a larger culture. But there's also patrollers. There was also back into slave times, you know, this was a, a that no one talks about and enough, I don't think, that this was a part of unfortunately the mission and the work. Those patrollers went and busted into those cabins and corralled black folks. So unfortunately and sadly, this is a longer standing tradition than we realize. I think many of us do, many of us do realize it, of course. Um, but I'll just finish by saying this conversation currently and how God has used uh, these deaths, these, these painful, tragic deaths to make changes in the world that, have, that, that are answers to prayer, long, long time prayers as we've watched what's going on. Um, I, I see the hand, I do see God, what, what, the mm -hmm. sum of what God is doing in this. Mm -hmm. Delia? So I got a lot to say. So, um, <laughs> How we got we got time. <laughs> you know yeah. how has it fueled my uh, me? Well, first of all, I'm always in doing equity work. Um, I'm a change agent, so I God called me a long time ago to this particular work. I think He called me about like four years old because my mom was like, "Look, when there needed to be when there was issues of injustices, you was the one that was speaking up, and I speak up with volume." I guess one of the things that I want to say is, is that we continue to mourn. Mourning in the black community is something that I don't, I'm one of those people, I don't wait until somebody physically get killed to mourn. I mourn here every single time that a black child in, enters into an institution where their cultural experience is not valued. I mourn. I mourn that, you know, my black community does not have access based off of white supremacy. And because they continue to create and create packages and ways in which I can't get access to certain things, I mourn. I mourn any time that even if a black student or a black child just makes a mistake and ends up in prison, I mourn. So uh, one of the biggest things that I, I stand on is that I don't pick and choose which way I mourn, I mourn regardless when anytime a black body 
is destroyed, whether physical, mental, emotional, I mourn. Um, one, I guess one of the things in this current moment that I guess I've been paying more attention to is the gender issues. Breonna Taylor's killers are still out here. It's still out here. It's still out here. While we tend to, and I'm overgeneralizing, not everybody, but while we tend to memorialize Black men and take their bodies and, and, and have funerals and have memorials, I often think about Black women, but I also think about individuals in the LGBT community who often, their bodies are not often heard because based of off their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a lot of different layers of things that I've been paying attention to. And then oftentimes now I just see that because social media is propaganda at its finest. <laughs> I think during this isolation piece, social media has been off the chain, okay? You know, I've heard people say silence is compliance. I was like, wait, where do you get that from? You know, <laughs> not compliance. Right. Right. Silence also used as a resistant tool to, to think, you know, oftentimes we didn't know where Jesus was at in the crowd. Somebody knew by the time he left, oh, Jesus, then he went on to the next, he <laughs> went to the next town. This was like, Jesus was over there standing there in the crowd in, in many different places. He would sneak in just to view and observe, to see what was going on. Cause he wanted to know if these people really were gonna follow me. And so oftentimes I, I look to that um, there's just been so many different dynamics of now those people who claim that they woke is, I think it's because the wokeness now is because we have been in isolation in COVID. COVID is now letting people sit down and have to face the reality that their privilege, their biases, their stereotypes and all those things, it's a mirror reflection. And so now they're waking up in some sense, but even with that wake up, is even problematic because then there's these packaging of ideas to say, oh, I, I support Black Lives Matter movement because I got a t-shirt that says Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I, I, you know, oh, you know, I support Blackness because I got, like you said, Dr. Bay, I got a Black friend. No. No. <laughs> right, no. No. Uh, that's right. Awesome. I just kept doing that the whole time. <laughs> Right, like this, right. like what? You know why? You know what's going on? And so, I would just say that white supremacy is packaged differently now. They use the same tactics. Let me tell you, whiteness is incomplete. Let me tell you, if white, if white supremacy was so powerful, we would have been wiped out. But because there's so many cracks in it, we have the ability to get into those cracks and blow it up. <laughs> right, right. Wow. exactly. Yep, <laughs> powerful, powerful. Yes, Pastor Cheryl. So one of the things, um, and of course, I, I just really value what's already been said. Um, I place the, the highest respect and priority of what's already been said, very powerful. Um, one of the things that I think that has happened during this time with COVID-19 and the race, racial unrest and injustices and inequities that we see um, is exposure. Yes. Um, to me, um, this has brought about a, a whole new level of exposure in terms of what we've done wrong and what we've done right. Um, I've often, you know, God has often used me to be like um, the consciousness of, you know, of the black church. I've, you know, call myself like the thorn inside of the black church. Because <laughs> my messages, um, I challenge, you know, the church um, in terms of what we've lost, what we fail to accomplish and our, our state of complacency in terms of addressing the issues and the problems within our own communities. Uh, I lived during the time of the 67 riots in Detroit. Uh, my grandfather had a business uh, on 12th Philadelphia was right there seeing all that destruction. But just prior to that, I remember uh, the churches being um, a, a, a fortress, a, a, a stronghold within the community um, that brought people together, that addressed 
you know, all these many social concerns and issues that plagued, you know, the black community from the police brutality, just like we've got it right now, we had it then, we've had it throughout our history, um, all of these different injustices, but what seemed to be more predominant at, during that time uh, than right now is the fact that the churches were um, instrumental in being the agents of change that we were looking for, that we needed. Um, we found our place, you know, in, in the church because the church was the nucleus of the community. And so, um, it, you know, what I find is it's really shed a light on this my, this old sermon that I just keep preaching over and over again about the, 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 the complacency of the black church. And I'm not saying that in a, in, you know, in so, such a critical way, but just take our urban areas, take areas like Indianapolis, Chicago, Detroit, where you have five and six churches in one block, one city block, storefronts, 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 big church, storefronts, store. and then you look around and you see uh, the desolation, you see the destruction, you see the hopelessness, you see, you know, all these things that the Black community, the Black church should be addressing. So in my opinion, now we're all now, we can't get in the church building because of this virus. And I think it's, it's caused us to sit at home on our butts and really, you know, tap in to the fact that, hey, we have not really been in relationship with God in the way that we should be, because we would be, our agendas would be different. And I think this is shedding a whole light on, you know, how inactive we've been, how sluggish we've been, how lackadaisical we've been about all these issues surrounding our people. And now it's bringing to light Yep, we've been failing in certain areas. And now, hey, we, we, it's time to get back on the front line and really be the core of people, Christian people, people of faith, you know, that God has already, always instilled in us to be. And the last thing I want to say is that it's caused us to understand that we are Black people. We can't adjust our lives to a social norm of our counterparts. We can't be like them. We gotta be like us. We have to be our authentic selves. We are resilient people, a strong people, a spiritual people. You know, and all of these this these strengths, but we're still here. I tell people all the time, black people just like roaches. You you think you <laughs> they come back. They're coming back and here they come. So we got rid of them. No one knows here they are. So we're resilient people, and God has made us that way for a reason. He's made us that way for a reason. And we just really need to understand who we are and tap in, you know, tap into that strength we have and, and really bring it back to our communities, starting with the church, starting with the church. Thank you for that, um, Pastor Cheryl. So speaking, let's, let's pivot now to, you know, our mission, you know, we're here, Black women, CWU's mission. CWU serves urban women, you know, which of course we know this majority um, are black women, but um, speaking specifically to women, what have you witnessed about the things that we're going through now? And um, some of it has been brought up in terms of like um, how a light is not shined equitably on those women, trans women who um, are just as caught up in, in all of the uh, tragedy, but it's not, it's not shown, it's not, it's not highlighted. But are there other things um, about this time of you know, COVID-19, um, inequities in, in race and other things that are affecting women that you see. Um, Dr. May, you can start. Uh, well, I, well, I would say for both really the um, what's going on with the racial violence being shown and the COVID-19, um, speaking about what uh, Cheryl was was saying about um, what, what, what we're all saying about our strength. I'm seeing what we always see of black women and women. I'm sorry, women in general. I'm not sorry, but women in general, <laughs> women all women is a. Uh, it's not new that women are on the front lines. Whether we get the spotlight or not, women are always on the front lines. Uh, it was women who you know waited for Jesus to be brought down. 
uh, to, to take care of his body after the cross. It was women, it wasn't by accident, who were the first ones who saw and believed and went and tell, told the, the gentlemen who didn't really believe it right away. Um, we're always on the front lines, we're always carrying the message, we're always seeing about the bodies, we're always care, caring for the souls. And in times of tragedy, we see that highlighted and this is no, you know, that yet again. Um, I feel that oh, I'm seeing uh, women's strong shoulders yet again, carry, carry, caring for having, during COVID, having to teach their kids at home. There are dads that do it too, for sure. But caring for the, you know, having to now be uh, elementary school teachers on top of trying to um, feed their families, on top of trying to deal with the the emotional pains of the separation and the loneliness and the, uh, and and the spotlight on those things that COVID nineteen and social distancing has brought about. Um, I'm just I'm seeing just just those strengths, our the women's strengths from all kinds of backgrounds, and politically, uh, we're uh, that's that's the same thing again. Um, I can't wait to see John Lewis's uh, documentary, uh, John, the wonderful John Lewis. And you know, to his credit, he's one of the ones in, in the in the civil rights movement, past and present, who says the women in the movement. Oh my goodness! I mean, you know, just carry that movement. Names we don't know still, uh, as well as names that we do. So I'm just seeing the continuation of that tradition of women in black women, but women, like you say, from all backgrounds, carrying those families for their for people to lean on grow from, be comforted as they mourn and help others mourn. Um, I'm just seeing our strengths through all of it. A and that our strengths and our voices uh, are helping what's making the difference, pushing legislative change, pushing a legislative agenda, pushing people to be uh, accountable, uh, all of that, all of that. I'm just, I'm seeing us uh, do, seeing women do what women do and, and watching that, that just continue. Mm -hmm. Adelia, Adelia, sorry. Absolutely. I <laughs> I <t> <laughs> okay. Um, I yeah, I totally agree. One of the things I do want to say is that first of all, black man, we love you. Yes. Woo! I just want to put that out there. We support you one hundred percent. We love. We care for you. We care for you in ways that you can't even imagine that we care for you. And I think because I keep seeing this stuff on social media and, and you know, I follow social media a lot just to see what the conversation is, is. And what's happening is, is that there's just a lot of black men who are going through deep rooted trauma. I mean, trauma of number one, being a male, <laughs> trauma of being black and male, then the trauma of societal constructs that they were raised on and patriarchal you know, issues that have been thrown onto them. Um, and so the reason why in which we continue to carry, I guess the cross, ooh, that's kind of deep. Um, <laughs> we continue to carry the cross is because number one, <sighs> they're becoming extinct. Like the genocide of black men is, 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 it's going, it's going crazy. And I think oftentimes we don't often, we, we tend to demonize black men because they're lazy. They ain't doing this. They ain't doing that. They ain't producing. I'm just like, look, there's a lot of issues on why these things are not happening and why we as women have to carry and say, okay, we love you, we care for you, we're gonna work with you. I'm carrying your hand. George Floyd, these people, my, my black men, my, my, my black men friends and whoever else is like, I'm working with you. However, I understand that there are a lot of different issues that one has to sit with. Do they have to? No, but it's, it's thrown on to them. And so as women, I see in, in the politics, I see on Facebook, I see us getting into these leadership roles is because they're still, we're still not talking about the genocide of black men on why we think about mass incarceration. We still have a lot of black men incarcerated, <laughs> mm -hmm. the end. And so then too, once they get incarcerated, the new young black sons who are we are raising, something happens where there's this book called The Wrong Place, Wrong Time. And it's this about this medical personnel lady, I mean, man, who talks about 
we always talk about the wrong place and wrong time, but what actually is the wrong place and wrong time? The issues of equity, the issues of these, the issues of necessity on why they can't get access to certain things and why someone like me have to carry on. I think about Amy Garvey, <laughs> Marcus Garvey's wife. You know, my man was locked up. I mean, <laughs> so she had to continue to write the newspaper. But what can we do? It's one of those things is that I, I've, I try to center my narrative to say, I don't hate you, Black men. I actually love you. I'm bringing your narrative to the table. So anytime that I'm up in these spotlights, I think oftentimes we we're like, oh yeah, Black girls rock. You know, that's great. But Black men rock too at the same time. And so I bring those narratives to the table to say, look, there's some issues on why they're happening this way. And there's some issues with us as well on why we get burnt out, overly burnt out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Pastor Cheryl? Well, um, yeah, and I agree with everything that's been said. Um, my sisters here, they, they just, they're hitting it all, they're hitting it on all cylinders. <laughs> respect of uh, these issues we're talking about. Um, and I think that, you know, with Black women, um, you know, God has girded us with uh, amazing strength and resilience um, for a reason. Um, and we all know, as already, already been said, that um, there's been a a systematic approach to killing off our men. We, we know that um, throughout history, throughout time. And, and I think it's, you know, basically because um, there are many people from for, for generations that really know the truth about who we are as a people. And that truth has been suppressed and it's been, you know, it's been very strategically um, suppressed um, so that the heads, the heads of our, our families, the heads of our communities, who are, who are the men, you know, can, can keep those men repressed and oppressed and suppressed. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, you know, debilitate the family, you know, debilitate our children. And, um, but, but getting back to the women, my mind is all over the place, just dealing with this whole um, onslaught this, this onslaught of um, attack on our people. But, but women, uh, black women in particular, we have the genetic DNA, uh, the genetic dis disposition um, of the whole human race. Within black women is a gene that is uh, unknown to any other race of women. We carry the gene of the entire human race, which means we are the first people. We are the first people. We and Black women are the are the mothers of all humanity, and so it's no wonder that we've been made to be so strong, you know, and and resilient. But we want our men to we want to walk beside our men. We don't want to have to continue to bury our men. We don't have to. We don't want to have to continue to grieve over, you know, their status, you know, where they are, you know, in the world. Um, but at the same time, I think that. Uh, and I think that all the women here represent a knowledge about um, not only our strength um, and our uh, ability to persevere in God, but also our ability to persevere, you know, based on our own primal traditions that we've long abandoned generations and generations ago that have to do with tapping into, you know, who we are. We are the Oshuns. We are the... Shangos, we are the Oyas, we are the Oguns. There's parts of our African spirituality that that can play a very major part in our healing and our restoration. And it's just coming to this, you know, understanding that we have to know ourselves. We have to know who we are, embrace it, and forge the path, you know, for, for generations after us, our children and our grandchildren, to have that same understanding about who we are as a people because we are great people and other races know that oh yeah 
that's why they band together, you know, to um, bring about our, our demise. Because they know. More than we know, they know. And so I, I, I just feel that, you know, um, as Black women, we are nurturers and we are teachers. And so we do have to teach. We have to teach um, the knowledge about who we are, where we've come from, where we're going. Um, we just we just have to know those things. Mm -hmm. Can I add just mm -hmm. one more thing as sure. well? Because um, I, I know, I do know what you're saying um, with Siwu because it, it's a woman supported organization and mm -hmm. uh, uh, we do keep because because we're sisters like we keep circling back to the you know because that's where, where so much of our work is of course with black women but i, I want to just add one other thing as far as your question of what we're what i'm seeing what we're seeing uh that that i'm excited about i know people have talked about this i've never i'm seeing a lot of white women take george floyd's death the uh, Eric Garner's and the others as well, but we know that George Floyd is the one that seemed to wake people up maybe the most in the most recent times with the with the the fact that it was just broadcast. I'm saying white women take that personally. That to me is a, a part of a cultural shift a little bit, I think, as far as why we're seeing so many white men and women and of other backgrounds marching and saying this, helping us say this has to change because I'm seeing people like, uh, because they're seeing it for the first time. Too many times we weren't believed when we said this is what goes on. Um, and so I am seeing more, more women, not just white, you know, we say black and white in our culture, of course, but women of different backgrounds joining to say this, I take this personally too. And I feel that the power of those other female voices do help to push these changes as, as well, from what I'm you know, saying. I don't care about no white woman trying to figure out I'm, I look, I'm unapologetic to say that who cares? <laughs> At what point does that matter? If a white woman backs up a black body's death, like at what point does that even matter? Because in, in some sense, I, you, you can't even fathom the deep rootedness of somebody actually going to their grave. It yeah. just... You know what I'm saying? Like backing up to say, well, now I kind of understand. No, you don't. <laughs> and in some ways you need to do some inner work, which takes years. It don't take today and George Floyd's body to be relayed to rest in six feet down in the ground for you now to wake up to say, oh, ho, ho. okay, I'm glad that you got some type of consciousness awakening. However, what are you actually going to do? Mm -hmm. okay. And that got to start from your family unit to your mm -hmm. DNA unit, like your inheritance. You're going to have to you dig that thing up. So in some sense, I'm like, uh-uh, I, mm -hmm. I don't, I, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. play those games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, that's, yep. that's, that's powerful too. Absolutely. Well, that's why we're here to bring these different perspectives. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that actually moves me to my next question in terms of, and you know, we'll start with you, um, Idalia, since you brought this up, you know, talk about the changes. You know, we don't want to just sit here and say, this is not, you know, this, you know, we, we know this is an injustice. We, you know, this is preaching to the choir. A lot of times when I do these, um, when I've been on panels and when I've facilitated panels and things like that, I actually don't want to talk to y'all. I want to talk to, I need to talk to the people that are on the other side, that don't get it, that don't, and, and in some ways, I, you know, in some ways I don't either. I mean, I'm, I mean, for me, I'm weary of this too. You know, I had a friend who, when all this came down, she was like, what should I say? Well, I've been talking to you for, I don't know how long. So I'm not going to say anything else to you. Do you, um, like a friend of mine says, you have Google and Wi-Fi like everybody else. Figure it out. Okay. You know, so. Um, so I, yeah, there is some of that weariness, I got, but um, even so, you know, we're here affirming each other um, and leaning on each other. And I, I want to hear um, what changes would you like to see even in the institutions that you're dealing with, the community groups that you feel things are lacking, whether that's out of our community or other communities. Um, and, and also what have you, you know, done to, to do some of these things? You know, what are you doing to move this agenda? Uh, um, our lives forward. You know, it's not an agenda. It's not a hashtag. You know what I mean. So, Idalia, 
can you start with that? Yeah, so um, again, like I'll say, it's, it's all about your inside work. James Baldwin talks about that in Fire the Next Time was like, you know, white people can never change until they start checking themselves. <laughs> they have to start checking these things. And I mean, all the way down to the lineage and beginning to say, okay, what is it that I'm doing? What is it that I've been born into in order to move forward? And so one of the things, the solutions, oftentimes we want a quick fix solution. And I keep telling people, uh, Patricia Hill Collins, who wrote The Black Feminist Thought, as I talked to her one time face to face, she said, in order to create change, you have to learn how to survive. <laughs> You got to learn how to survive. And so my thing is when I'm in the classroom and I have the opportunity to either teach something, we are talking critical things. We make things uncomfortable. Yes, you have to be uncomfortable to talk about race. Yes, you're gonna have to be uncomfortable to talk about discrimination, stereotypes, et cetera, et cetera. And if you get mad and you bent out of shape because you don't wanna talk about it, guess what? Ain't, this space ain't for you. <laughs> and it's one of those things, it's like, as I am maturing, growing, you cannot force people to do anything. That is a, that's a choice. That is a choice. And so you say, well, what's the solution? Is beginning to have critical, meaningful, impactful conversations. And it doesn't take a whole crew of people. It could be two or three sister girls, two or three white people, but also as in the black community, we have to understand that we need to understand that it's okay to listen, to hear what people are saying. I think oftentimes we're so quick to pop off that we miss, we miss the mark of understanding, okay, Number one, so-and-so is not exposed. So what does exposure mean <laughs> in this context? I mean, beginning to break that thing down. And so as I was on, I was looking at a live earlier today, they were like, what's the solution? Baby steps, two or three conversations, being able to have a critical conversation where I can be uncomfortable <laughs> too, and you can be uncomfortable, but I can still have a conversation and leave the conversation with something. I think oftentimes we wanna make big old grand movements. Oh, I'm gonna create a movement and I'm gonna march downtown. No, you know, sometimes it's about creating small steps to get there. It, it, it really is. And, and really starting to, it's more, cause I know now we, we all, I think I saw on social media and everything else, we doing anti-racist training now. We reading all types of books. Patricia Hill Collins, The White Fragility. We trying to tell people, go out there and buy all these books. Okay, that's great. But what are you going to do with the knowledge of these books? Mm. <laughs> I got a whole book right here. <laughs> but it would be nothing for me to continue to read books and to pour all that knowledge into me if I'm not creating small. And it's, it's talking about this. We're creating change right now in this conversation. To say, now, when I go into my workplace, when I go into the church, when I go to the, I'm going to say that I have the right to speak up and I'm going to speak up with not, with being unapologetic and quit saying sorry and all these different things. Because <laughs> we do, because I say it too. I always say, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, no, I ain't sorry. This is what I meant to say. And I stand on that. And so in being able to do that, those are some of those small solutions. I think oftentimes we always feel like we got to go down to the square and walk with the Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement to order to create change. But if you're walking around Jericho with, with some tools and the tools don't work for the walls to come down, then what's the point? See, Jericho, God told the people and gave them tools for a reason. The horns wasn't because of the horns of the, the loudness of the horns to let the walls down. It was about the hearts and the deep rootedness of the people and what was going to happen next outside of Jericho. Once the walls came tumbling down, it was after that, that was the change. And so oftentimes I, I just, one of those people, I don't believe, I think we will overwhelm ourselves if we continue to try to tackle something so big when we could do it just right here. So. Mr. Cheryl. 
Um, yeah, what comes to my mind, um, just being in concert with what's been said is, uh, you know, how do you undo something that has been done over and over again for centuries and centuries? Um, it's not a, it is not a quick fix. It's not going to happen uh, overnight. And it does take people that are committed to being agents of change and speaking your truth um, and being able to back it up with information. A lot of people, you know, they talk about, you know, what we're supposed to do, what we should be doing. Um, you know, they, they, you know, they talk about everything that's going on, but they're, they're not able to back it up. Like, you know, back it up with action and back it up with facts, um, cultural facts, you know, things that are going on around us that we can back with statistics, with facts, just with your own eyes, with, with you seeing, you know, what's going on around you. Um, a white person is not going to be that readily um, agreeable to give up their white privilege. Um, it's something that they've lived with, their ancestors have lived with for generations and generations and generations. Our black people are not, the light bulb is not going to immediately come on and we're going to know who we are. We're going to understand our history. We're going to know our, our, uh, our rich legacy, you know, our royal history of royalty, kings and queens, you know, <laughs> from the motherland. The light bulb is not going to come on because we have, we're dealing with layers and layers and layers and layers of racism, of injustices, of lies and myths and fallacies that we as a people have believed a lot of it. White people as a people have believed a lot of their so-called truth. So, you know, given, you know, to give up your white privilege, um, it's, it's not something that they're gonna be like, okay, yeah, racism is wrong, let's give it up. We, we, we wanna be equal with y'all, we down with y'all. It's not gonna be like that because to give up something <laughs> that you've enjoyed, you know, um, just because your skin is a certain color, is not something that you're going to be all that uh, uh, excited about giving up. So um, small conversations like uh, Idalia was talking about having those small, uncomfortable conversations, which in the work in my workplace and even in the church, um, pricking the consciousness of people with hard truths. You know, whether you're talking about the church, your workplace, your community, your circle of friends, you know, wherever you find yourself and this conversation comes up, having those difficult conversations and being brave enough to just speak the truth, not your truth, but the truth. What is <laughs> now, your truth is your experience, you know, so you can speak all day about your truth based on what you experience. But what are what is the truth, which means you got to know some stuff. You got to know some stuff. You got to you got to have the knowledge to be able to um, <laughs> to put to put put in that last that last bullet. Bam! This is it. You know to get people to you know to think on your level to get people to understand where you're coming from, and hopefully come on board mm -hmm. with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Dr. May, um, uh, I would say that. Um, in agreement with what, what's been said as far as, you know, the small steps and the baby steps, uh, the, the reason for me, the reason that I, uh, I, I, I care about the, to answer the question, the reason I care about, uh, the white women who have, uh, <laughs> who take it personally or whatever is because it, because of the baby steps, you, you never know where the growth is going to start for somebody what's going to hit them in a certain way. And um, one of the things I was thinking about was the strategery. There was a lot of strategery in the um, civil rights movement in the 60s and the 50s. And one of them had to do with understanding imagery and the power of imagery. There was a specific reason that Martin Luther King invited uh, Jewish leaders and synagogue leaders to march with him at the front. He did that on purpose because he wanted people to see the the locking of arms of white people and black people to get because it's a it, it is baby steps and just like everyone has said I totally agree white folks are not going to jump to get rid of their privilege or let it go but to but to start to think a little differently maybe see an image that might be a little different 
maybe think you can relate even if you can't totally but then relate on you well you know what i know that my grandfather was killed so let me see if i can try to understand the death or what what we don't know where it's going to come from but all of it if it can help us start a conversation move a little bit more forward and just like the uh the lady said um having that bravery armed with knowledge to answer some of those questions i think that um i know that hearing a lot of white folks uh, i'm hearing a lot of them saying for the first time uh I, i'm hearing white people say to white people we need to be quiet you need to like like shut up and ask some questions and that's, that can be good because it doesn't mean they don't have valuable things to share, but about this, you, you don't know. So you need to ask. We know you need to ask. We can help you learn a little bit more about how you can be uh, an ally and, and of help to moving us all forward. Um, uh, for myself, you had asked part of the question was, what are we doing? I'm having those conversations also. But also, I, um, I'm a board member of the Michigan Psych Association Foundation. And they uh, give grant money to support um, uh, graduate students in the doctorate work and stuff like that. And one of the key changes I made when I came on board was to say, instead of giving graduate money to all kinds of different areas, give it to, to get graduate students of color specifically. Specific, let's, don't be afraid to say people of color or black folks or whatever, um, and, and tell them why that's important and why those students may need support. And, um, and so those are just some of the things that I'm doing myself from an academic perspective, uh, just like it's been said in my classrooms to talk about it. Um, one last thing I'll say too is uh, I had a supervisor when I was coming to graduate school, uh, Dr. Mbaye Ramsey, he was wonderful. And one of the things he talked about was the importance of discomfort in clinical practice. And we know that we have like pharmaceuticals pushed on, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, take a pill so you numb the pain, take a pill if you feel anxious, that kind of thing. And one of the things he talked about is how our bodies are wired and we have nerve endings. So if your nerve endings don't work and you touch a hot stove, you don't know to snatch it back. If you know to snatch it back, that's your body telling you there's something there. So, um, that's one of the things that I try to promote also is just like, like everyone's been saying, uh, some of those conversations are, are painful and difficult. Um, but I would have to, uh, uh, I, I would add that that's, that's part of the process and it can be a good part of the process because that discomfort tells you that, that that's a place of maybe some work that needs to be done, that self-introspection that, that was spoken of already. Um, so that's, that's my, my perspective. Uh, live with that sit with that pain for a minute be uncomfortable a little bit and uh, recognize we don't know where those changes might come from but it, it all if it if it can help us move forward in making and, and putting a stop to this and, and changing our trajectory and work. be willing to get in the streets sometimes we hide back in our silos so much that we hide behind the institution we hide behind our houses we hide behind the church we hide behind all these different things and so sometimes we don't go into the homes to yeah. sit and talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm guilty of that as well because we have been conditioned to do certain things based off of fear. And, and we have to be fearless individuals being able to say, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but let me tell you, and the streets is not necessarily, I always say that the hood is beautiful. I always say that the hood is beautiful. It's a beautiful place where people, culture and values and morals and things of that nature. And so um, I'm one of those people, get your hand dirty. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's for sure. Right. That's for sure. That's for sure. Right. You know, yeah. there was um, it was a comment in the chat and also something that came up um, on from one of my friends that I posted on Facebook. When they were saying um, regarding you know white people being involved and marching and all of that type of thing, and seemingly like um, being more willing to to vote where they need to vote, but what he said was voting is great, but where change really happens is in the day to day life. So that when these young people grow up and they have families, um, are they going to send their children to bl to black schools? You know, schools that are majority black and fight for the equity in the black schools that they may have somewhere else. Are they going to, when they're the hiring manager, choose the black um, project manager, the black um, you know, web designer? 
not if they don't know these people, you know, not if they, if, if they don't know who, who that is. If you're not this, and he ended, he says, if you're not letting us in the country club, then when it's time for you to buy your house, are you going, who are you going to hire when you talk about, you know, this equity and things like that? So he said, he, you know, he kind of concluded saying that, yes, you know, things happen in the voting booth, but more than likely, it's going to happen in real life. And when you have these kinds of decisions, more than likely you're going with people that you know and your friends. But if you do not have friends outside of your circle, then this is another way that we're just perpetuating the same stuff over again and it just becomes rhetoric and not real action. Okay, I have a couple more things um, before we take a few questions. I do have written some questions down. Um, circling back to our topic, why is it important to have spiritual growth in this time or in times like these? What is it that is important about spiritual growth? And I think I wanna tie that actually into my next question too. What are some specific self-care tips, however you define that, um, that maybe our audience, because people are gonna watch this now and then they're gonna watch this later, um, can tend, you know, that are impactful, that they could possibly um, take on uh, re related to spiritual growth. So why is it important and what can they do? So who wants to take that? I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in and start. Um, one, reason, one reason that I feel it's important and it's been important for me in my own life um, is that it, it sounds cliche to say, but true material things, things of the world can come and go, can disintegrate and be rebuilt. But your spirituality, your spiritual anchor uh, that you carry with you is something uh, people can't take away. We talk about being enslaved in the mind I mean, or, or free in the mind of your body is enslaved. Um, that's something that can't be just taken from you. And so it's a stabilitating factor. It's a rock that, that you know, we can lean on that spiritual strength and spiritual growth during this time or any time of unrest or chaos. Um, it's something that it, it does not come and go, but uh, again, you can, let, you can lean on it and it stays with you. And, at least from my own faith, it grows with you. Um, I, I, we're definitely, like you say, we're speaking to people of, of many faiths. Um, I can speak from my own experience um, and my Christian faith. I, I had this conversation with, with our brother. I, I think one of the things that's so cool for, uh, for me, one of the things that's so cool about our scripture, it's called the Living Bible for a reason. And it is that uh, I read the, the whole Bible cover to cover more than once. Um, I, my grandma did it, my mom did it. I was like, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I read the cover to cover, my mom, you know, cycling back, I'm in Isaiah now. <laughs> um, but what, one of the things I think is so cool about the Living Bible is because, like my husband put it too, I don't care where you are in your life and how many times you read it, this is as you grow, it's just deeper and deeper. It just speaks to like whatever, wherever, even this time of COVID, it's, you know, uh, it, it, it's in there, it's in there. So. Um, our spiritual, to answer your question from, from my perspective, our spiritual growth is so important during this time and any time of, of trial because it, it doesn't go away. I mean, I mean, you can let it go. You can leave the faith, but it, you know, that thing, that rock that you stand on, it, it, it'll be there when you come back. It'll be there when you get back. It doesn't, it's a steady thing. God is a steady, a steady being. Um, what was the other part of your question? I'm not uh, sure. Specific, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any specific, you know, a couple of uh, two or three specific self-care tips, however you oh. define that for people who are going through that. I know, you know, you and I did, Angela and I did a presentation on grief mm -hmm. during this time because grief is very different. Um, I won't say very different, but it is different um, mm -hmm. than what, you know, than pre-COVID um, in terms of you know, not having your access to rituals that you had. You can't even go to the hospital a lot of times. Yeah. Um, funerals are so different now and all of those things. But Angela, did you want to speak to any specific? Uh, oh, self-care. Uh, there, there are, of, of course, lot, lots of them. Um, uh, one of the things that our family also, my dad was an athlete, you know, so we're all extra, exercise regularly. Um, 
So that, that's one, I think that's important, whatever that means for you, taking walks, moving your body. It's, it's important, obviously, for our physical well-being. But the thing about moving your body in whatever way works for you, I love to lift weights but I love to walk, yoga, whatever. But the movement, because we're holistic, whole beings, whatever we do physically, it, you know, at our spiritual well-being, mental and emotional, it's all connected. So movement just by itself, it causes us to breathe more deeply. And that deeper breath, it's, it, there's a connectivity between uh, nature, ourselves, our growth and release, that letting go of stress. So physical movement for sure. Uh, whatever, whatever it, it feels good for that person. Um, and then also I would say uh, another one that's really good, of course, is journaling, uh, writing. There's something about putting a pen to paper and writing out how you're feeling. It may, you can make it a daily you know, ritual. Uh, I do a thankfulness journal, but what are you feeling? How is this impacting you? Um, write about your grief, write about that act of writing it out. Um, you know, psychologists have shown, research has shown that with learning, we know this is, as teachers also, the more of the five, the more of the five senses you can access when teaching and learning, the more, the more deeply it impacts you and stays with you. So if you speak it, you write about it, the act of physically writing it out, it, it, both of those things, the physical movement and journaling and writing are ways of de-stressing, ways of centering yourself, your mind and your body, uh, both actually journaling too can it's, it's a way of like helping you exhale a little bit um, and all of those things can be helpful for self-care so that you don't just um, we can spiral a little bit you know out of the all, so much that goes on in the grief right now um, so those are two things oh, and of course always prayer and meditation um, you know definitely centering calming brings the blood pressure down helps you find, uh, and, and, and one last thing I'll say, we all know this about journal, if we've done journaling ourselves or, or advise others to, it, it's something you can go back to. And we learn from what we, you know, past pages we've read and we can see our growth. We can see what we're letting go of and what we're holding on to. And so it's an ongoing learning tool, but those three things I would say, prayer, meditation, journaling, and, and movement mm -hmm. for self-care. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Anyone else? Oh, so our spiritual, you, can you say that again? Sorry. Sure. Okay. So one, why is it important to have spiritual growth during this time? And then any specific self-care tips for people who may be watching um, that are, you know, struggling during this time and, well, and want to continue to grow in their spirituality? Well, it's important to have spiritual growth during this time or any time is because again, like Dr. May said, you do need something to hold on to. <laughs> and one thing I would say is, so how do you get to that spiritual level? It is going to be, it has to be a daily thing. And so for me, just an example, I carve out an hour space for just myself. I turn off Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you got. Grandma, mama, love them. <laughs> right. We'll be back. <laughs> yeah. And just really you know, just reflect. Um, I think it was like the second week of COVID um, that it started getting real crappy. I was just like, dit, 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 just turning things off. And so what you do is, you know, put an inspirational song on, um, find a book with a favorite quote, you know, look at something maybe on Facebook, you might wanna jump back on Facebook because let me tell you, sometimes people say great affirmations about you that you save and so, um, as me, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends, great people. There are certain things that I just screenshot and keep into my archive on my phone to remind me that number one, that I'm beautiful, that I'm powerful, that I'm great, that I'm worthy, that I'm this, that I'm that. And so spiritual growth, it's, it takes time, but you also need an accountability partner. While I believe in isolation, I also believe you can't do it by yourself. We tend to mess up all the time because we try to do everything by ourselves and we get trapped. I have a great sister friend, RGJ. I ain't gonna say your whole name because you don't hear <laughs> <laughs> But there are times where I may polo her, I may inbox her. I have different sphere of influence. So I have my, my church sisters, I have my entrepreneurship, spiritual sisters. I have my black male friends who are just great people. I have 
my academia people. And so there are oftentimes, if I know I need spiritual healing, I'll reach out to the people who are spiritually tapped and on the same realm as me and who have positive affirmation. Like today, I just called her and she said something just, you gonna be okay. And I was like, I don't feel okay, but <laughs> I guess I will be okay. But just that small little thing mm -hmm. is being able to have different spheres of influence to keep you grounded and keep you to remind you that you're not, you're not alone. You're not by yourself that I'm here with you. I got a group of people, if I need to, if I need prayer, because sometimes we can't pray for ourselves. Sometimes you just get so just frustrated and, and so messed up to the point where you can't even utter. Sometimes you just cry. And I'm like, no, I really want to say something, but this crying is going to get. So I'll call my sister friend and say, hey, I need prayer. And she goes right into it. And so some of the spiritual, that's some of the things that I do. And of course, cracking open the word of God is always a plus knowing that those those uh, scriptures that I learned when we was little kids and when grandma and them it didn't make sense to us but then when we got older we said oh that's what she meant by that um being able to mm -hmm. use that but also use devotionals as well um Christian devotionals it don't necessarily have to be Christian but inspirational devotionals that can help guide your walk and can guide your thing youtube videos i mean there's some great awesome people who were speaking some fire out here like oh my gosh like some holy ghost fire for real and using those different spheres of influence to pour into you so that you can be revived mm -hmm. and so those are some of the things that i do but i also i take holistic baths so i'm one of those people who do Epsom salt and clay and baking soda and <laughs> lavender and just throwing it in there and being able to just shut out certain things. Um, but then you also need a group of people that can just make you laugh. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we just do stuff so serious. We just take right. stuff so seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's just good to just laugh at something that don't even make sense. And just mm -hmm. be like, did you see that yesterday? That that chicken across the road, <laughs> they got to the other side. You know, just the other side. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> but I've learned because if we're going to create change, we really have to take care of ourselves. We really do. Absolutely. And um, microaggressions and racism and all these different things that are never going to go away chip at us every single yes. day, every subconsciously, day. unconsciously. And so we wonder why we're feeling some type of way on a Monday. Or it's not just because we woke up on the wrong side of the bed, that there are principalities. Like I said, there are spiritual warfare. There are things that we do not see that are going on and that for his people who know him, know that who believe in him will go through trials and tribulations. And because we go through these trials and tribulations, we have to be filled up with the overflow. And, and some of us as women, we pour and we pour and we pour, but we need to be poured into. And so it needs to be reciprocal. It needs to go back and it needs to do like this all the time, all the time. And so um, those are some of the things that I have done. And when I tell you, I stopped saying that um, I'm not going to hang out with no women and all this other stuff. Because you know that that used to be the conversation at one point. I ain't going to hang out because men know me better than all this other stuff. <laughs> you know, no. Get you some sister friends who've been through some things, who understand some things. And you can just speak something. And they, she understands what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. can be there to give you a hug, to love on you, and to get you where you need to be. Oh. Oh, Pastor Cheryl. Yeah, well, um, first of all, um, one of the ways to cultivate our growth spiritually is to, um, you know, to realize that we are spiritual beings first. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And when God created us, he, he, uh, he blew his ruah into us, his breath, breath of life. And um, his, his spirit, his pneuma is, is within us. And so we connect to the source, you know, which is God. Spirit to spirit is our first connection, you know, to God. And so we have to do what we need to do to cultivate that spiritual well-being and staying connected to the source. And for myself, you know, what I, I get up early in the morning, every morning, um, and I spend time with God. You know, I spend time in, in meditation. Um, I pray and I journal a lot of my prayers and I just, in, in my prayers, they don't, they're not formal. 
I talk to God like I'm talking to, you know, my sisters here. Um, like he is my best friend, you know, and just like, God, I don't understand all this mess, you know, that's going on. You know, you just talk, you know, real, you don't have to be formal with God. And I journal a lot of my prayers and I, and I, and I, you know, sometimes I reflect back and I see the hand of God and how he's taken me from day to day, you know, how he's healed me from certain thought processes and certain things. So journaling uh, prayer is a, is a good thing. And, um, I also do things, you know, being a musician, uh, I love to listen to music. So there's sometimes, you know, you got to detach mm -hmm. from normal routine. I don't, I don't watch a lot of TV. I could probably not even live with a, a TV in my house, but, um, you know, just detaching, putting you on some John Coltrane or some Thelonious Monk or listening to some Sarah Vaughn, you know, yeah. just... <laughs> I walk in John PT all the time, you know, right, 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 right. <laughs> jazz, get into some Teddy, get into right. what it is, whatever it is, is you know, that, 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 that soothes your spirit, you know, it soothes your spirit and think positive, you know, Philippians four and eight says, you know, find me my brother, brother, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are honest, of good report, you know, trustworthy, you know, those are the things you think on. We got enough to think about every day. We know what's going on in the world and it's, it affects us every day. We have to counter that with positive thoughts, um, positive affirmations, as the sister was saying, you know, think about things that people have spoken into your life that are positive and affirming. Whenever you're doubting yourself, whenever you're feeling really low, someone has said something to you that made you feel really good. Even if you can't think of, 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 of but one thing, think on that one thing and focus on that. And um, so, you know, I do a lot of things. I, lo I love lavender. So I, lo I love the scent of lavender. Um, yes. <laughs> that, that's kind of like, I, I don't smoke weed, but I burn incense. <laughs> that's all right. We burn incense. Love incense. Love, love yeah. incense. Candles. Yeah. Candles. Whatever, yeah. Cre whatever creates your sacred space, you know, you, you should you should do that in abundance and you should have a designated time each day where you just focus on yourself. That's right. Focus that's right. on you. And the last thing that I do. Uh, that I, 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 dis I rediscovered because my mom passed away in May and um, she was like a hundred women in one, um, the greatest mentor I've ever had in my life. And she used to garden and I hated garden when I was a little girl because she'd always make us weed, just weed stuff. And I was like, I'm sick of weed and stuff, you know, you just want to see the end product, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I, I started really taking serious gardening now. And it is the most magical thing to plant a seed and to watch that seed grow in, in stages. It just does something. You know what it does? It gives you the idea that you can create. And it's really not an idea. It's a reality that you can create. Women are, we are creators. And uh, we do have the ability to create beautiful things. And so if you, if you ever get in, if you just want to just even just grow one thing, one little plant, um, I challenge you and I encourage you to do it because just to watch how you take care of something and, 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 and watch it grow and watch it flourish, you know, it's, it's a magical thing and it does so much for your, your, your human, human spirit. Mm -hmm. so much Absolutely. For you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we, um, I found two questions because um, we're going to wrap up our time here. Um, that addressed uh, some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. And uh, one actually came from um, our executive director, Rhonda. Uh, what can families do as, as, as a family unit to address healing? Talk. Talk. Yeah. <laughs> talking. Talking. Sometimes talking can get you into trouble depending on, <laughs> depending on the, um, the family relationships. But... Um, I know uh, getting back to the positive side of social media, like, you know, people will share what they're doing with their, um, uh, whom they may be quarantining with or, you know, their families and stuff. I, I posted a uh, chess board, you know, my, my mom got back into chess a little bit, my husband playing. And um, so I, th I think even if it's not formal, like, you know, like a formal healing session or whatever, but, um, Spending time reconnecting with the fun things, the things you enjoy about each other, um, talking, 
playing checkers, you know, stuff that, um, you know how people are trying to get away from saying you're stuck at home, but rather you're safe at home. Uh, rebranding that, you know, save it all. <laughs> uh, so it'll go start crazy or whatever. But um, if, if for those, if, if they're in the house with you, um, talk, you know, just spending some time, you know, actually carving out time to turn off the TV maybe and, and uh, talk, reminisce, uh, look at uh, what, what are the uh, photo albums or, or, you know, and, and just reconnect a little bit, laugh and talk and enjoy each other, remind each other of Remember that time when, you know, play a little cards or checkers or chess or whatever. Um, so I, I think just sometimes just doing some doing things together uh, that builds connections, even if you don't mean to like <laughs> by accident, cooking together, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, that's one thing that's something that came to mind, just uh, spending that time sharing whatever it may be. You go out for a walk together. Um, just being out walking, you know, can, can you know, start a conversation and chat and, and uh, all of those ways of co connecting and reconnecting, I think, with family and thereby can be healing. Anyone else? Absolutely, I totally agree. Um, another thing is too, is being able to have um, a deep rooted conversation, watching a documentary. When I was growing mm -hmm. up, my family, I, I'm, I'm just so blessed and I'm grateful for my family that when I was growing up, we would watch documentaries. And then after the documentary, yeah. grandma, somebody in the family would be like, okay, down the list of the grandkids. So what did you learn? All right. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Yes. But being able to have those conversations is powerful. Um, but then I also want to talk too is like being able, you know, what what does family look like too in this period because I want to be mindful that everybody's yes. family does not look the same and it's not just what we were blessed with there are people I want to let people know that your family may also be your friend unit and or people who support 100% so I want to be mindful to also encourage that as well to say your kin folk <laughs> is your family and being able to say, hey, I have some, a group of people or somebody, I don't care if it's just one person that makes me feel like I'm at home because we know that home is, is we don't know what, you know, we always think home is two, four walls and things of that nature. No, you know, home is, for me, home is about an experience. And so I want to be mindful with that as well. But that that is one lens that you can do with your family, but also, like you said, talking and discussing and things of that nature, but also making sure that you just reach out. I've, I've learned during this isolation period that just calling someone and say, hey, you came across my mind today, you know, and being able just to have a, co a conversation, not saying that I'm checking on you because I had to, you have to be mindful to say, well, I'm just checking on you. And then that's it. No, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hey, you know, you came across my mind today and I thought about you today. You know, how are you? How are you really doing? You know, and being able, you will hear so many great stories, but also stories of just when they need somebody just to listen. Mm -hmm. And so being mindful with that as well, that's something during this time that you can do is reach out to the next door neighbor. I mean, there's some neighbors near me. I, you know, sometimes I don't even want to talk. I just, just <laughs> go to my car and mind my business. But I've learned over time is just saying, hello, you know, isn't it a beautiful day today? Oh, yeah, it's screaming hot outside, you know? And just to see the light of their smile just light up that somebody actually acknowledged them is just absolutely amazing. So that's just a family unit as a whole, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pastor Cheryl? Um, yes, and I, I would agree with that, you know, reaching out, um, reaching out to family members, reaching out to friends, you know, developing or, or even cultivating the circle of trust that you have, you know, in the, in the movie, Meet the Fockers, you know, Robert De Niro had, he was so funny, but he had this thing called a circle of trust, but he took it to another extreme, <laughs> the circle of trust. So you should have a circle of trust that you're able to, you, to find your safe place in, where you can talk, where you can be transparent where you feel free to uh, express your, your, uh, your emotions, your feelings, no matter how wacky they may seem to somebody. Because during these times, like I said, we're going from A to Z 
in terms of how we're feeling, uh, our emotions, you might feel really happy one day and then the next day you may feel kind of down. And so if you, if you know that, that you're apt to have those kinds of emotions all over the spectrum, then you know that people within your family, people within your, your circle um, are going to be dealing with those same issues and same struggles. So it, it's good to reach out and um, develop activities. I'll give you an example of one of the things that we did as a family with my siblings and their, and their children, nieces, my nieces and nephews and grandkids. We just started it today. We, you know, this Zoom thing has gone, gone crazy. <laughs> like whoever created Zoom, I know they're sitting back with a fat cigar in their mouth like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, you know, this is really amazing. So, you know, you, you're picking out the good out, you're extracting some good out of all of this. And so one of the things that we did was we started um, a black enrichment uh, uh, family time, black family enrichment time, let's put it that way. And in, in our family, everybody has an area of what we call expertise, whether it's painting, whether it's playing an instrument, um, whether it's, you know, you're an attorney, you're a contractor, you're a developer, whatever your area of expertise is. And so... We're, we're, we're pulling from those areas of ex expertise and we're teaching a little bit of, of our, our areas to our, to the children, you know, and they're, they're telling us what they want to learn. And so I'm the family historian. So I'm, I'm teaching fam the history, like of our family, as far back as I can go. Yeah. As far and, 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 and it's, kind, you know, it's a good ways back. I'm, I'm kind of proud about that, but um, you know, you know, our, our, our history here starts here, you know, in terms of how far back we can trace that name and exact tribe, you know, and exact this and that. But um, we started doing that. So, you know, cultivating activities that promote involvement and um, validating how, er you know, everybody, the way everyone one feels is valid. And you should never say to someone, you shouldn't feel that way. We got all this going on for us. We're blessed with this. No, people are entitled to how they feel. And you have to validate where they are. Because in some way, sometime, whenever a situation hits, you will find yourself in that same position where you want somebody to, to not discredit how you feel, but to validate. So validate each other. Cultivate a safe haven for your family where everybody can talk and they may be difficult conversations sometimes, but it's all a part to developing a healthy unit where everyone feels trusted, where everybody feels loved, and everybody feels affirmed. Awesome. Your prayer. Don't forget prayer. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Ooh, yes. Okay. So we have run out of time, but this has been absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And um, what I'm going to do is, um, since we're going to wrap up, I'm going to ask you all to just email me your information. I'm going to put it in uh, the description so that if people want to follow you on your Instagram, your you know, Facebook, your website, the things that you're doing, you're all doing such positive things. We, we are all doing such positive things. And um, I want to say, um, Idalia, I've been hesitant on your name because we had that discussion about say the name right. And I just, I, I, <laughs> I am so, I'm just, I'm always like, oh my God, I so I, I apologize. It wasn't that, it's just, I'm just being extra careful. But I'm gonna put an extra on this. We are gonna speak it into existence. This is Dr. Wilmoth over here. Oh she's yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, she, she's gonna, yeah, we, we are so looking forward to, to, to yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You absolutely. You know, I'm tired of these classes. Yes, and, and Dr. May can relate. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> And I talk about it all the time, you know, just, just start practicing Dr. Will. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. Just make it happen. Right. Pastor Cheryl, I mean, it's been, I'm so happy. Pastor Cheryl and I just oh, recently connected right. probably over the past year, and it has been yeah. so powerful and wonderful. Yeah. All yeah. of you all, and of course, my sister, yeah, we know. So, but it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Siwoo, thanks you um, for doing this. Um, I know uh, Rhonda did put in the chat our next seven dimensions of wellness summer conversation is physical wellness and it's going to happen on Thursday, July 23rd at 6.30. So thank you all for joining us tonight and be, be safe, be happy, be spiritual, keep the faith. Yes. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. Good night, everyone.